Father God, we come to you today with hearts that are in near constant need of refreshing. God, I ask that you would open our eyes that we might see your glory as it's revealed in the gospel. Open our ears that we may hear your voice and your calls to obedience and deep fellowship. And in all that we say and do, may Christ be honored. And we pray this in his holy name. Amen. Now, a lot of you may already know this, um, but it was during my college years that I had the opportunity to perform concerts in churches all around the country. And over a three-year period, I was fortunate enough to play a few hundred concerts a year, and I was able to spend time in 42 out of 50 states, which was a pretty cool experience. Uh, But one of the oddest things that I realized in doing that much traveling around our very large country is that it doesn't matter where you live in the United States, some natural disaster is going to try to kill you. (laughs) That is true. Uh, So from the earthquakes on the West Coast to the unbearable heat of some of the Southwest to the forest fires that we experience here in the Northwest, it's all bad. There's volcanoes in Hawaii. There is snow and freezing temperatures in Alaska. And then you have tornadoes in the Midwest. Now, I am originally from New York City. Uh, uh, It's a fact I only bring up when it's relevant. Um, And in New York and along much of the East Coast, our natural disaster of choice is the hurricane. Uh, If you've only ever lived in landlocked Montana, it might be hard to conceptually understand the devastation that occurs when wind is traveling at 115 miles per hour and the ocean begins to come through your front door. But that's what happened when I was in New York in 2012 uh, during Hurricane Sandy. I got to see that happen all over Staten Island where I'm originally from. It might be hard to imagine rain washing away entire houses. It might be hard to imagine winds and and wave swells that could not only knock over your car as you tried to escape, but to take your toddler out of the window and bring them into the ocean. That is devastating. And that's what a storm can bring. And we are powerless against it. This is a force of nature. It's chaotic. It's uncontrollable. It's untamable. It's unreasonable. To try to stand against it is to lose. Stopping these kinds of storms is impossible. And the destruction that a storm can create feels inevitable. And yet... In our passage today, we encounter one who can speak to a storm and it obeys. One who calls us out into storms where we can find him faithful to provide for our safety. And we encounter one who gives us hope that even if our lives cannot escape tragedy, if our faith is in Jesus, then we can be sure that we will be with him in his kingdom where every storm is stopped and the seas are as calm. As glass. And our big idea for today is this that because our sovereign God is more powerful than we can imagine, following Him is the safest we can be. And in this passage, we're going to see three things. We're going to see that Jesus sets the course, that Jesus saves the perishing, and that Jesus speaks to our heart's greatest need. Once more for today, since it's a short passage, let's just look at it in full for one more time. Luke 8, verses 22 to 25. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. And so they set out and they sailed. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled. 
saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? So today our passage is uh, kind of an action-packed story for a Sunday morning. A superstorm builds on the water and the disciples fear for their lives only to be rescued by their sleeping friend and teacher who can calm the seas with his words because he is in fact God incarnate. But this roller coaster event starts with a really humble beginning. Jesus gets into a boat. He tells everybody, let's go to the other side. The disciples get in the boat. They sail off. Jesus takes a nap. That's act one. That's, that's, that's how it starts. But our point to look at here is that Jesus sets the course. And this is really important. In verse 22, it says, one day he got into a boat with his disciples He said to them, let's go across to the other side of the lake, and they set out. So right off the bat, a couple of things are happening. Jesus is about to expand and extend his ministry farther than it's ever been before. He needs a boat. He's got to get over. And when he crosses the sea, more and more people will hear the good news of the kingdom of God. And as we'll see in the coming weeks, many of those people will be Gentiles, people outside of the Jewish faith, people from whom the kingdom of God was very much a mystery to them and held off from them. And we see the disciples acting in faith. Jesus is leading and the disciples are following. He tells them where to go and they go. Luke 8, 21 which we read last week, says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And well, now the disciples have a moment where they have been able to put into practice what Jesus has been saying. Jesus has spoken to his disciples. He said, let's go. They say, I, I, and then they all get in the ship. They've heard the word of God and they are doing it. They left their homes and their town and they followed seemingly without any hesitation. And the passage doesn't spend a lot of time here, but what the disciples show is a real faith in Jesus and in his mission. The lack of story here is the story. Jesus calls them out on a journey, and they go. Today, there are things that Jesus is calling you to, or calling you out of. Maybe you're wrestling with whether or not obedience is right or necessary. And as the disciples will find out again a little later in the passage, following Jesus is always worth it. Obedience was both right and necessary for them, and it is for us as well. So they shove off from shore, and it says at the end of verse 22, the beginning of verse 23, so they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. Jesus' work is done. He's got a crew of people, most of whom were fishermen, like up until five minutes ago. They know when they're sailing, where they're sailing to. They've been across before. This isn't new. There's been lots of long days of healing all who came to see him. That's the language that we've been seeing. I bet all takes a long time to get through. It's a big number. And he needs a break. After all, Jesus is a human He's constrained by weariness, as any one of us would be. But Jesus is also not like any one of us. Because Jesus is fully man and fully God, he can set a course that runs directly into the path of a storm and still fall soundly asleep. The disciples do not know what is coming, but the sovereign God, Jesus, certainly does. And yet it has no impact on where he asks the disciples to go or on his ability to rest. Do you think it's any different today? Does Jesus still call us to follow him even though storms are coming? When I say that Jesus, the one who knows everything and how everything will work out, is the one who is setting the course When you consider how that might be true in your life, does your heart become willing or worried? Does it become willing or worried? 
Do you say, on account of the gospel and the great love with which I've been loved as Christ took the penalty I deserved and clothed me in his righteousness, on account of that, I'll go anywhere. I'll follow anywhere. Do you become willing? Do you become worried? Worried that God might call call you to follow him in two storms? Worried about what you might lose if you do? And while you may be worried about losing yourself, the truth is that has always been the plan. And just a little later in Luke 9, Jesus lays out the stark difference between following him and following the world. In Luke 9, 23 to 25, he, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You can follow your heart and gain the whole world only to find that you're a slave to sin, letting every worldly whim control your direction and define what makes you worthy. But when we follow Christ, it is him that makes us worthy. And it's in following his course that the longings of our souls are satisfied. It says in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Though it may not always look like it when you're following Jesus, when you're on the course that he sets, you are on the safest path And we can trust in his love for us because he has already demonstrated it and proved it to us at the cross. And now while we have this unique and beautiful perspective today in light of the gospel, the disciples, unfortunately, did not. And their day is about to get worse. So picking up in the middle of verse 23, Luke 8, 23 to 24. And a windstorm came down on the lake And they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. And this brings us to our second point for today. And that's that Jesus saves the perishing. I don't know if you've ever had a bad time with water but usually they're pretty memorable. They stick with you when you have a bad, bad day with water. Uh, maybe you get pulled out by the riptide once when you're in the ocean, and it changes where you'll swim from now on. You're done with that foolishness. That's not going to happen again. Maybe one day you gulp in too much water at the lake, and now the best day ever is ending with tears Um, that's actually a saying in my house, all the best days end in tears. Uh, With my kids, I've had a few of those already this summer. Uh, But there was one time with my son Ezra, with my youngest son, where he had a really bad day with water. Uh, One spring day when he was just two years old, our family took a bike ride down to the creek. It had been a, a long and snowy winter. We were all excited to see life coming back to the Bitterroot Valley. And it was beautiful, but the water in the creek was, was very, very high. So, so high. And I had only been here for a couple years, and I didn't know how, how bad that could be. It was moving really fast because of the snow melt. And it was awesome, and it looked awesome. And Ezra wanted a closer look. So he took one step, he looked over the edge, and boop, right into Low Low Creek. Now, somehow, in the span of what I will generously call one second, (laughs) I saw my two-year-old fall into a raging creek. He turned around and he looked up, completely submerged, eyes open. I I can remember exactly what he looked like, pure terror. And um, 
And then Jessica, who was right there, immediately snatched him out. And so it was a very big deal, but it was a very short period of time. Um, and he was fine. Things could have been really, really bad, but he was fine. But for the next two years, all he could talk about was that time that he rolled in the grow. <laughs> Which I guess meant I fell in the creek. <laughs> but like any time he wanted, like if you came over for dinner, he'd be like, it rolled in the grow. <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. Like it was... It was like a big, big thing for him. He couldn't get it off of his mind. There was no conversation that we didn't have for years that at some point didn't turn into, hey, remember that time? Rolled in the growl. <laughs> he told everyone who would listen about the bad time he had with water. Now, most likely, since most of the disciples had been fishermen, the disciples would have had multiple memorable days of rolling in the growl. And this makes their response to this particular storm that's happening in our story all the more unique. Luke says, and I'm going to summarize, a windstorm came. They were filling with water. The waves were raging. They were in danger. They thought they were perishing. These experienced sailors thought that they were going to die. That's the scene. And at this moment, none of their training mattered, and their years of experience only helped them to accurately see how bad their situation really was. And so when they wake up Jesus, they are coming to him freaking out. I think sometimes the Bible goes through translations and we read everything really stoically and coldly, but like they were not doing well. This was a messy day. They were freaking out, and they were telling Jesus to help. And it says in Luke 823B to 24A, and a windstorm came down on the lake. They were filling with water. They were in danger. They went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And they wake him up. They come to wake him up because they don't know what to do. They think they're going to die. Maybe they wake him up because they think they need Jesus' help with the bucket brigade to like bail out some water. Maybe they just want him to get ready to swim to shore. It could be any of those things. The disciples want to wake Jesus up, but what's interesting is that they don't ask him to do anything. Even though they've seen him heal every disease and bring people back from the dead, the disciples are proving that they don't really understand who Jesus is. If they did, well, then they could have the option of two faith-filled responses to this storm. They could have simply persevered through a very difficult storm knowing that Jesus has set their direction and that they will arrive at their destination. If Jesus says we're going to the other side, we're going. They could be sure of that. If they were feeling a little less bold, then they could have woken him up because of their great need. They could have come to Jesus for help because he's the Lord over all creation and he's powerful enough to help. He can actually change their situation. Now, the disciples knew enough about storms to be really afraid of this one, but they didn't yet know enough about Jesus to have their fears relieved. There was also probably some embarrassment on the part of the fishermen when they needed to admit that they couldn't handle the storm. But they couldn't handle the storm. And the entire category for why they woke Jesus up should have been different. And thankfully, even though they came to Jesus uninformed about his power and authority, Jesus proves to be good and kind. He knew what to do. And in this moment, Jesus is going to use the disciples' trial as an opportunity to clarify things for them. The disciples have gotten Jesus awake, but it's them who need to open their eyes. The disciples had faith enough to get into the boat, but now they need a faith that will keep them in it when things look rough. And they've asked Jesus for help, but what they need is salvation. And praise God, that's what Jesus has come to do. In Luke 8, 23 and 24, it says, And a windstorm came down on the lake. They were filling with water. They were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke. 
and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. And throughout the Bible, the sea is seen as an instrument of God's blessing or his judgment. Whether it's teeming in life in Genesis 1 or bringing death around the world during Noah's flood in Genesis 6, the sea is a mighty tool in the hand of God, and it is a tool that only God is powerful enough to wield. And Jesus has just revealed to his disciples that he is the one who controls the sea with his words. This is who is leading them. This is who set the course. And now the storm which caused one fear to die will give way to a greater fear because the disciples are beginning to have a better idea about who exactly is in the boat with them. They are in the presence of the one of whom it says in Psalm 107, 29, he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. You know, it was interesting as I was preparing for the sermon, I thought about how amazing it is that Jesus could speak to a storm and it would obey him. It obeys him because it's his. He's the creator. It's always obeyed. And then I thought about us and what sin has done to us. And I thought about that contrast that exists that everything in all of creation obeys God except us. And that's part of what is so offensive about sin. That's what's so evil about sin and how we've turned away from God. That's why the punishment for sin is death. Sin has blinded us to the reality that we have attempted to make ourselves God in our own own eyes while simultaneously being completely powerless and completely unlike God. But Jesus is not powerless. And so in this moment, Jesus is moved by compassion to save his perishing companions by taking up his power and glory to command the storm to cease. But it's only a matter of years before Jesus will be laying down his power and his glory, putting them aside and commanding sin and death to take him instead, dying in our place and paying the penalty for our disobedience. In the boat that day, the disciples had lost all hope, but Jesus has always come to save the perishing and those who cannot save themselves. In Luke 19.10, it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is all throughout his teaching. So whether he's a ruler forgiving a great debt or a father welcoming a wayward son home or a good Samaritan loving those who despised him, Jesus has come to save the perishing and to rescue the needy. So today, do you recognize your need? In your own life, do you have chaotic carnage churning below the surface? Do you find that you're still at a place right now where you're just kind of testing out all your options for how you're going to deal with it. Maybe you see the fruit of disobedience all around you and you think to yourself that the only way out of your bad decisions is probably some more bad decisions. If that's you today, you do not have an accurate picture of who Jesus is and what he came to do. Your faith in yourself in your abilities, and in this world is misplaced. Today, as we finish our passage, Jesus offers a correction to us, and the course of our life hangs in the balance. He awoke, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Picking up in Luke 8, 25, he said to them, to the disciples, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? You know, with one rhetorical question, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and to us today. Where is your faith? And in this last section, we see that Jesus 
speaks to our heart's greatest need. Where is your faith? By simply asking the question, Jesus points out where the disciples' faith should be, it should be in him, and where their faith has been. It's not been in him. But again, this is a category-shifting event for the disciples. There will be more in the future. But after this event, they now know that Jesus is more powerful than they could have imagined. The disciples are now responding rightly to what Jesus has done. It says that they were afraid. It says that they marveled. The power they were afraid of used to be outside the boat, but now it's in the boat with them. What do you think is more frightening? A terrifying storm about to kill you or the fact that your slightly groggy teacher can stop a storm with a few words? We have all seen the devastation of storms, but we have not all seen God incarnate exert his authority over creation. They were afraid and they marveled. But it's precisely because of Jesus' terrifying power that we can feel safe with him. How does he use that power? And we've heard people questioning Jesus like this before. In Luke 7, 49, the crowd asks, who is this who even forgives sins? In Luke 5, 21, the Pharisees ask, who can forgive sins but God alone? And in Luke 8, 25, the disciples ask, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? The answer is only Jesus. All throughout the book of Luke, we are being led along as Jesus reveals more and more of his identity. Who can heal like this? Who can forgive sins? Who commands the winds and the water? And they obey him. It could only be Jesus. And why are these things happening? Well, they're happening, as Jesus will say in Luke 17, 21, because the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. While Jesus is on earth, accomplishing his mission, there is nothing that can stop him. Nothing is going to threaten his purpose. The kingdom is here in their midst right now. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Storms don't come and stop the boat in the kingdom of God. Everything bows before the purpose and the will of God. And where the kingdom of God is, we will never perish. And that's why the disciples didn't need to be afraid. Because the kingdom of God is with them. And for us today, we look forward to one day being with Jesus again in his kingdom. We want to be there with him. We look forward to experiencing the goodness of his kingdom. And though our lives may be full of tumult and trouble... Around the throne of God, the sea is so calm that in Revelation 4, 6, John calls it a sea of glass. So the where is your faith question is important. It's one we should all be asking. When Jesus is asking the disciples this question, they've just beheld his glory and have clearly seen his authority. And when Jesus asks this question, Of us today, where is your faith? He does it in full view of the gospel that saves us. Today, we may have lots of answers to the question, where is your faith? Our faith might be in our experience or in our expertise. It might be in our earning potential or in our retirement savings. It might be in the simple experience of everything always just sort of working out. But if these are where our hopes are, then one day they will fail us. And like the man who built his house on the sand, not only will we lose everything when the storm comes, but the underlying hopes that encouraged us to build sand castles instead of Christ's kingdom will be exposed, and we will see the waste of time, resources, and energy that went into propping up a life of false hopes. Following Christ and putting our faith in him will not remove trial and hardship from your life. In fact, you might experience 
more trial on account of following Christ. Look at the life of Paul. His ship didn't make it over to the other side four times. No, trial will not be removed from your life, but a faith that grows through trial will be added to it, and you're guaranteed it. You won't be guaranteed safety in this world, but you will know the truth that you were never safe until you received the gospel. And now, even if death takes you, we all share in the great promise of our God, which says in Romans eight thirty-eight to 39, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Today we've seen Jesus calm the waters with his word. When the Lord says to you, peace be still, are you willing or are you worried? Are you willing to be used by God however he sees fit? Or are you worried about what it will cost you? To obey God is always right. He has the power to calm the storm. He has the power to conquer sin and death. And he most certainly has the power to help us lead lives that honor him and bring us safely home. So I urge you today, when you hear the Savior's voice call you to obey, obey. Obeying God, even when it is hard, is the safest place that you can be for yourself and for everyone around you. The wind and the seas obey him because it is in their nature to obey their creator. And now by God's grace through his spirit, we have a new nature. We are new creations in Christ. And our obedience and love for the Savior, it grows as we marvel at the glory of the gospel. For it is through the gospel that we hear the Savior say to us, peace be still. And our hearts find their rest. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we Lord, come to you as grateful people, grateful that because of your power and your might and what you choose to do with it, Lord, you have redeemed us to yourself. God, you have made us to know you and to know you in your glory and in all of your perfections that we see in the gospel. Lord, we truly were our, the least safe we have ever been before we responded to it. But Lord, I pray today that when we look at what you've done and the life that you've restored to us in Christ, God, that that, that wonder and that awe at what you have done would be a, a fuel for our worship God, I do pray that you would bless us as we go into this week with whatever we may face. God, I do pray that the trials that we experience in life would help us to grow nearer and closer to you. God, I pray that they would help us uh, find you more and more faithful in the middle of them. Lord, we thank you that every good thing comes from you. Lord, we thank you that through every trial and opportunity, there's a way to grow to know you and love you more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.